and welcome to our 10 expert workshop for high molecular weight DNA sample prep techniques and best practices. I'm Shauna, the 10X Community Manager and your moderator for today. Before we get started, let's cover some quick housekeeping items. Our 10 expert, who I'll introduce in a minute, will be giving a brief presentation followed by an open Q&A session. We're recording this session and we'll make the recording available in the 10X community shortly. Please note that all attendees are on mute, and if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. If you don't see the box, it may be minimized, and you just have to click on the arrow next to the Q&A title to ex expand the box as shown to the right here. And finally, if you're interested in tweeting during the session, please use the hashtag 10 expert. Okay, now let's meet your 10 expert for today. Our host today is Jill Hirschlib the sample prep group leader here at 10X. Jill has a PhD in cellular and molecular biology and has spent the last 15 years working on technology development for high-resolution genome analysis, including optical mapping, long read sequencing, and precision molecular counting. A fun fact about Jill is that she's been working with high molecular weight DNA since 2003. And now I'm going to hand it over to Jill so she can get started with her presentation. Thanks, Shauna and thank all of you for tuning in today. Um, so today I'll go over a few basic sections in today's presentation. First, an introduction, including what resources we have available for, from 10X for all of you. Um, next, some general tips for working with high molecular weight DNA, followed by some specific protocol guidance, highlighting two of our protocols, high molecular weight DNA extraction from fresh frozen tissue, as well as DNA size selection. And we're going to leave plenty of time for Q&A today, so please do send in your questions. Now, DNA sample preparation for linked read sequencing in our chromium genome solution is very challenging, as most of you probably know if you're joining this WebEx. So at 10X, we dedicate substantial resources into helping you make every decision you need for sample preparation, starting from your biological sample all the way to a, a, a suspension of DNA at the appropriate concentration for running the chromium genome solution. If you go to support.10xgenomics.com, you can download all of our protocols for free. And we recommend, if you're looking for a place to start, start with a handbook entitled Sample, Prepar Sample Preparation Recommendations for the Chromium Genome Kit. And the protocols we offer fall into three major categories. The first is general knowledge and guidance. So general guidance on sample prep on chromium genome application performance as a result of DNA quality um, and DNA QC. We also offer protocols for DNA isolation from specific sample types, such as whole blood or fresh frozen tissue. And finally, we offer a general sample improvement protocol for DNA size selection. Now, I'll start out by asking the question, what is high molecular weight DNA? And as it turns out, multiple, defini multiple definitions are used out there in the field. I've seen greater than 23 kb, greater than 50 kb, greater than 100 kb. Um, but at 10x, we prefer to use a functional definition. So high molecular weight DNA really means the DNA is sensitive to physical shear, which, you know, 50 kb is a good ballpark for when that starts to happen. And what it means is that you have to change the way you prepare and handle your DNA samples. If you're worried about how you're pipetting, it's probably high molecular weight DNA. Um, but to be conservative, we recommend treating all genomic DNA samples as high molecular weight. It's safest. So let's talk about DNA QC. So before running a 10X solution, how do we measure high molecular weight DNA? And we're interested in two major things, DNA concentration and DNA size. So when measuring DNA concentration, procedures are identical, whether it's high molecular weight or non-high molecular weight DNA. So we recommend double-stranded DNA intercalating dyes. We do not recommend absorbance-based methods. And if you're running a small number of samples, we offer a protocol in our user guide for the qubit system from Thermo Fisher. And it's important there to make sure your DNA is in the correct range for the instrument and the kit and that you take two readings and ensure that the readings are within 15% difference from each other to make sure the solution is adequately mixed. If you have high throughput, high throughput applications, you can use a plate-based measurement technique, um, for instance, using PicoGreen. So contact us for advice if that's what you're interested in. 
But besides DNA concentration, you probably want to know about DNA size. And this is where procedures are very different for looking at DNA size between high molecular weight and non-high molecular weight DNA samples. So for non-high molecular weight DNA samples, you'll see bioanalyzer and agarose gels being commonly used for this assay. However, it becomes a lot more challenging when you're working with high molecular weight samples. So the most accurate methods for measuring high molecular weight DNA will be pulse field gel electrophoresis, which offers accurate sizing up to five megabases, and the femtopulse instrument from Advanced Analytical. We've tested this and gives very accurate measurements up to around 165 kb. So for intermediate accuracy, but at a low price point, um, the Pippin Pulse from Sage Science is a good choice. It'll get you sort of an over under 50 kb, which is a nice, a nice screening method for your samples. And then finally, we recommend empirically testing other instruments, such as the tape station, fragment analyzer, or using standard agarose gels. Um, these systems are a bit complicated. They don't necessarily offer the best resolution for looking at high molecular weight DNA, but they are useful. So we recommend just getting experience. If this is the equipment you have access to, just gain some practice and find what you can and can't measure using these systems. And here's one specific example. This is comparing a pulsed field gel, which is the most accurate, to a standard, accurate, standard agarose gel, which is one of the most limited ways of looking at high molecular weight DNA. Um, on the left, you can see a blue bar. This corresponds to four samples from DNA extraction method number one. And you can also see those four samples in the gel on the right. This red bar is the 48.5 kb marker. And you can see that on the agarose gel, or on the pulse field gel, you can see a nice smear, and you can see that most of the DNA is, you know, around or less than 48.5 kb. In, in contrast, when you move over to the standard agarose gel, you get the majority of the DNA migrating above the 48.5 kb marker, which we know may not be very accurate. The second sample type we're looking at on this gel is um, a new extraction method. The DNA is coming out to be around 242 kb as measured on the pulse field gel. And if you move over to the agarose gel on the right, you'll see a distinct band. It's higher than these other samples, and it's a crisp band. Um, so you get clear separation and accurate sizing on the pulse field gel, but um, on the standard agarose gel, you, you can see a difference between these sample types, but the difference is much more minor. Um, so that's why we recommend just gaining your own experience um, if you're using an agarose gel, standard agarose gel, to do, to do DNA QC. So that's before running 10x. What do we learn about our DNA quality after running 10x? So if you used our reference-based pipelines, which are long ranger and loop, what you'll get as an output are mean DNA size, the DNA mass you loaded into the assay, as well as a DNA length histogram. If you run our reference-free solution, which is supernova, de novo assembly, you'll obtain the mean DNA size as an output metric. And here I'll show you exactly um, what you'll get back from running loop. So this on the right is one panel you get back in the loop summary page. It's called input DNA. and tells you a few important things about your sample. First, it'll tell you the average molecule size in the sample, and this is after running the assay, 85 kb. And this is a length-weighted mean, so it's very similar to an N50. Another important output is the estimate of DNA loaded into the system. Here is reported 1.22 nanograms, and our user guide recommends a standard loading of 1.25 nanograms. And finally, you'll see a histogram displaying the size of every DNA molecule as measured by our software. This is a molecule by molecule histogram. So we know that this DNA length measurement is accurate. The DNA length measurement in Long Ranger is accurate. Um, we've tested in multiple ways, and one of the ways we've tested is by adding lambda DNA to the system. So lambda DNA has an expected size of 48.5 kb, and when we run that through Long Ranger, we get a reported value of 48.2 kb, and the DNA comes out as a nice single peak with, you can see, maybe some minor degradation products. But importantly, if you have a DNA sample that's above 50 kb, the length of that sample will decrease during the chromium genome assay, and this is completely normal. So this is a very standard sample type that we run. Sample will be about 200 kb on a pulsed field gel, 
but after the pipetting and DNA denaturation step and running through the chip, we end up with an average size of about 85 KB. So that decrease in size, you'll see that with every long read sequencing platform. Um, and this is expected, and this is really what we build all of our performance expectations around, is DNA samples that look like this after running through the system. So you don't have to worry that your DNA is breaking down a bit. That's all taken into account. And so we coined a term that we call DNA quality level. And that helps have a good discussion about what you get after running the system and what you should shoot for. So we use the term DNA quality level, and that's simply the mean DNA length reported after running the chromium genome solution. So the value reported right here in your loop summary page. And we created a very, very simple classification scale, five levels, one through five, and they're binned in 20 KB increments. And this very simple scale is useful for planning and troubleshooting. So what we recommend you do is identify the DNA quality level you need for your application, and then choose the appropriate protocol for DNA isolation. And we say when you're in doubt, aim high. Here's just an overview of several DNA extraction methods that we've tested with 10X Chromium Genome. Um, a number of common methods are on the left, and some 10X optimized methods are on the right. And I'll go through these later in the presentation. And we say that your quality level you need really, really depends on what you're trying to do. So if you're looking to do de novo assembly, we recommend aiming for DNA quality level four or higher. If you're looking for megabase phasing in our reference-based pipeline, quality level three. And if you're interested in phasing entire genes and SNPs, quality level two. And these are very, very high-level guidelines, but we have a technical note that will walk you through this decision-making process in much greater detail. So you can download this, again, from support.10xgenomics.com. It helps show you application metrics and the DNA and the response of those metrics to different DNA quality levels. So now I'll give you some general tips for working with high molecular weight DNA. And I always start by showing people this video because I play this video in my head every time I pipette a high molecular weight DNA sample. This is just showing single DNA molecules loose, loosely tethered to a piece of glass. And you can see how when they're elongated, they're subjected to breaking during uh, fluid shear forces. And that just underscores that high molecular weight DNA is a physically fragile molecule. And we've tested this systematically. If you drop an Eppendorf tube containing high molecular weight DNA, you can break it. So the, the band on the left is, a, is a, the starting tube. We took out an aliquot, dropped the tube on the floor, and you go from DNA that's above 225 KB to DNA that's below 225 KB. So you have to be very careful with these solutions. If you pipette multiple times, as shown in this middle panel, you can shear DNA. And these are both pulsed field gel images. On the right here, this is after running 10X. This was a controlled experiment where we extracted DNA, handled everything as if it were high molecular weight DNA, and at one step in the workflow, we switched pipetting speed. We pipette mixed our master mix 15 times, either slowly or at normal speed. And you can see just that one step can have a huge impact on the length of the DNA molecules. But all of that can be solved by just pipetting slowly with a wide bore tip. So if you're moving more than 10 microliters of solution, use a wide bore tip. If you need to, if you need to pipette less than 10 microliters, use the P10 tip, do it slowly, um, and don't use the P10 tip if you don't have to. That's our recommendation is when you need that accuracy, use the small tip. But if you don't need that accuracy, if you're just mixing a solution, please use a wide bore tip. And so we do offer specific protocols for DNA extraction, but there are many, many, many other good protocols out there. So if you're looking at another different, if you're looking at different DNA extraction protocols, here's some general do's and don'ts. So no surprise, do use wide bore tips and pipette slowly. And if you need to mix a solution, Mix that sample by slowly pipetting the entire solution volume with a wide bore tip. Don't use a vortexer. Really important, 
make sure that you do not store your high molecular weight DNA in water. It's very unstable. Use TE or another ionic buffered solution specifically for DNA. Next, make sure you're collecting your biological specimens properly to ensure optimal DNA quality. One example here is if you're drawing whole blood to isolate high molecular weight DNA, use an EDTA tube that contains preservative. We had one, um, one collaboration where we had two samples of DNA, one in an EDTA tube, one in a normal tube, the blood coagulated, the red blood cells burst, there were tons of oxidative damage, and the DNA was destroyed. Um, in contrast, the DNA extracted into the preservative tube was beautiful. So really, you have to start at the beginning of the process. Good technique can't rescue a bad sample. And finally, when using solid tissue samples, we recommend physical grinding methods as opposed to chemical buffers that are designed to dissolve tissue. We find those tissues to be too harsh and cause too much damage. Um, so again, don't vortex to mix samples or vigorously pipette mix, but also really importantly, don't heat your samples. So we've been studying um, at which stages of a protocol you can include heat and at which stages of the protocol you cannot because, you know, heat's important for enzymatic activity. It helps speed up things like dissolving pellets. However, we found that heat can cause single-stranded DNA damage, um, especially when you heat at the last stages, so bead elution or pellet resuspension. On the right is just an image from one of our technical notes showing a bunch of samples that look identical on a pulse field gel but the samples weren't treated identically. They were heated uh, at various temperatures for varying amounts of time. And when we carried some of those samples through the chromium genome assay, you can see you're going from quality level four down to quality level three at higher heating conditions. So it's really, uh, this is a very specific directive to avoid heating a purified DNA sample. And now for some specific protocol guidance. So at 10X, I'm gonna walk you through Three different protocols. Um, we have a philosophy when it comes to developing Z DNA sample prep protocols. Um, we don't aim for the longest DNA possible. What we aim for is a balance. So a protocol that gives you the quality you need, but has minimal hands-on time and sort of familiar, comfortable lab techniques. So it means we do a lot of modification to existing methods. We play around with mixing steps, heating steps, I'm sure you're not surprised to hear that. We replace buffers, um, and we've done this hundreds of times, so we kind of know the knobs that are available to turn and how to do so. And so we have three main methods, methods we call Magatract, Spry, and Salting Out. And on the right, in italics, these are sp the specific protocols you can download that describe each of these methods. So the first method is Magatract, and this is a Kyogen commercial kit. Um, we slightly modified the protocol, which is why we recommend, you know, download the protocols from 10X. It will contain the explicit instructions. And this protocol is compatible with cell suspensions and whole blood. And here is a box plot showing hundreds and hundreds of examples that we've run. Um, cell suspensions in the blood give identical results. Um, the, average, the, the average size after running chromium genome is typically between 80 and 90 kb. And this is absolutely the standard sample type at 10X Genomics, right here. Uh, it's a very easy protocol, takes about an hour. However, we ran into a roadblock. When we tried to use this kit on fresh frozen tissue samples, we were not able to get any higher than quality level two. We tried a bunch of different tricks and nothing worked, so we really tried to start fresh with a new protocol. We call this technique SPRY, really for lack of a better term. Um, what this protocol is, is a semi-homebrew magnetic bead method, also known as a Franken protocol. So we picked and choose different techniques that we knew worked in isolation um, and strung them together to get a workflow for high quality DNA from solid tissue in a few hours as opposed to a few days, which is some of the other techniques that we were working with. Um, and this protocol will require optimization if you're working with different sample sources. So anytime you get into solid samples is where the range of sample types become much more diverse and can present um, a diverse number of challenges. Finally, our last and most recent protocol is called salting out, and it's a method that was originally published in 1988, and I've used this method many times throughout my career. It's really simple, and as you can see, gives very high quality DNA. 
So we've tested this on cell suspension, and you basically lyse the cells, add concentrated sodium chloride to crash out the protein, and then you do um, an alcohol purification of the DNA afterwards. You, you have a slippery pellet that you have to resuspend, so it can be a little tricky if you're not used to working with pellets, but it's very straightforward and the reagents are very cheap. Um, we think this protocol is likely also compatible with fresh and fresh frozen tissue. And in the lab right now, we're currently testing this technique on single insects. And I'll go into some details around our DNA extraction protocol for fresh frozen tissue. because This will highlight some of the ways we think about protocol development, and hopefully this can be useful for you guys as you take on new sample challenges and are looking for optimization advice. So what we end up with is a protocol with four basic steps. And first is the tissue preparation. We basically thaw your tissue on ice and cut out a small piece. We find you have to work pretty quickly here. You wanna let your tissue sit just enough so that it thaws, but don't walk away, don't go out to lunch, let it thaw for a couple minutes and then put it right into the grinding buffer. The next step is nuclei isolation. So we found the best way to get high quality DNA is really to separate the nuclei, which contain obviously all the chromosomes, just separate them from the bulk debris connective tissue, get them away from the rest of the biological sample as quickly as possible. And we found the best way to do that is to use a cold buffer. It's a nuclei isolation buffer. You just plop your tissue piece in there and you use one of those plastic 1.5 mil tube pestles and you just almost use a downsing straight up and down motion a few times. It'll release the nuclei. And if you let it sit, the big tissue pieces fall to the bottom of the tube. And that's really important. This step is simple and allows you to get rid of most of the junk. And that, that's really what inhibits some of these protocols is not being able to separate out the parts you don't want. So after the tissue falls to the bottom, you can take that supernatant, which has your nuclei suspension, into a new two mil tube. You just spin it down and you resuspend it in a simple lysis buffer containing all the ingredients you're probably expecting, EDTA, proteinase K, and detergent. And if you've done these types of protocols before, you know at this stage, you might end up with a pretty viscous solution because High molecular weight DNA is viscous or snotty. It can be hard to pipette. And so what we found here is that if you just let that solution incubate statically, you will get high molecular weight DNA afterwards, but it may not have a long shelf life. So one of the things we found is that you actually need to mix up that sample periodically during lysis and proteinase K digestion. What we hypothesize is that there are some pockets um, where if you don't completely inact inactivate all the nucleases, if any of them get carried over, they can really lead to a short, you know, d days. Your DNA can look great, and then three days later, you won't have anything left. Um, so we solved that by just putting the samples in an end over end rotator and gently having that whole lysis solution move around. But you can find your own solution. Maybe you come with a wide bore and mix it every 10 minutes, and that works well. But that's one area that we know can lead to a short half-life. Then finally, once everything's lysed, once the chromatin's digested, once all those nucleases are inactive, all you have to do is purify the DNA. And so what we did in this protocol is just add spry select reagent, and you could probably use ampere beads, that would be fine. Um, add those to the tube, rotate the tube again to bind the DNA to the beads, and then you just wash the beads with ethanol and elute the DNA in a low ionic strength buffer. We found this protocol is nice because it delivers high molecular weight DNA that in our hands wasn't viscous. So it was easy to work with, easy to quantify, easy to pipette. And so we've tested this across a few different users' hands using two different types of tissue, breast and liver. And we chose these two types of tissue because liver has a terrible reputation for isolating high molecular weight DNA. It's an incredibly enzymatically active type of tissue. Um, so we were expecting that this wouldn't perform very well, and that's exactly what we found. So we found with three users, we got very, very similar results following this protocol with fresh frozen human breast tissue, um, and similarly poor results from the liver tissue. And all of the breast tissue samples were sequenced, um, and as you can see, they all returned quality level five DNA. Um, we also sequenced all the liver samples, quality level one, 
unsurprisingly. So, so again, depending on what your tissue type is, you may need to modify the lysis buffer. You might have to put extra chelators in there if you have extra nucleases, for example. But besides our three extraction methods, many other extraction methods are compatible. And actually, this is an important point. You don't need high molecular weight DNA for chromium genome. It really just depends on what you're trying to discover. So you can use clinical archival cohorts, simple common methods like spin columns, or there are automated solutions we've looked at too. This is the Promega Maxwell 16-plex instrument, and we're also testing the Chemogen 96-plex instrument from Perkin Elmer. So you can get really good performance from a number of different extraction protocols. But if you want to make your existing DNA better, if you can't go back and re-extract it, um, we recommend size selection using instruments from Sage Science. The, overall, the overview of these protocols is that it allows you to specifically remove undesired fragments from a genomic DNA sample. For example, removing everything less than 40 KB. So you can increase the DNA quality level of your samples. It's simple, you just load the DNA into an instrument, choose the right protocol, and you remove the ellulate that contains side-selected DNA, and you can directly use that as input to chromium genome solution. On the right are some results, and I'm only going to focus on one panel because they all tell the same story. The control sample, this is a DNA molecule length distribution, similar, similar to what's reported by loop, but I had three samples, so I had to color them three different ways. So the unsized selected, this blue trace, has a peak at around 30 KB. If you take that sample and run a protocol that removes all DNA less than 20 KB, you get the pink trace. And you can see the peak has shifted. This first dashed line is 20 KB, and there's really nothing below that line. If you take the same sample, run the less than 40 KB size selection protocol, you get the green trace. And this vertical line is at 40 KB. So functionally, this does exactly what you want it to, which is remove smaller fragments. So this is a good option for archival DNA. So in summary, high molecular weight DNA is physically fragile and must be handled gently. And I do want to emphasize small changes can make a very significant difference in DNA quality. So you might be pleasantly surprised. Um, but you might not need high molecular weight DNA for chromium genome. It really depends on your application. If you go to support.10xgenomics.com, you can access all of our protocols, and you can always contact support at 10x uh, for technical support or start a conversation on the 10x genomics community and get answers from your peers. So with that, I'll thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jill, for a great presentation. Uh, we're going to get started with our Q&A session. Remember to type your questions in the Q&A box on the right side of the screen, and we'll do our best to get through as many questions as possible. All right, let's get started with our first question. What's the recommended DNA input molecule size for genome and exome analysis? That's a good question. So earlier on in the presentation, I'm just going to go back a few slides here. Earlier in the presentation, I pointed to a technical note that's available on our website, and it will really go into chromium application performance as a result of DNA quality and sequencing depth. And all of these figures were generated using genome data. So if you're looking at phase block size, sorry, phase block size over here, the dark purple line is um, what you want to pay attention to. The additional lines as described in the document are for lower sequencing depth. You can see the way that some of these metrics will respond to DNA length. So if you're interested in best quality phasing, we recommend having DNA quality level 5, which is above 80 KB. However, if what you're interested in are more clinical type applications, if you want to find if variants are cis or trans within the length scale of a single gene, you can have DNA which is much shorter. Again, we're looking at the dark colored line here. You can go down to DNA that's around 20 KB, and you're still phasing more than 80% of your genes. And these recommendations largely hold true for exome as well. Um, so what you really have to do is figure out what matters most for your application, and then figure out where on the scale you need to be. So this 
particular technical note has, I think, 25 different figures on different metrics, including variant calling, indels, structural variants, long-range information such as phasing, and all of the de novo methods, all of the de novo performance methods such as N50 scaffold size and N50 contig size. So this is really your go-to resource for figuring out what DNA length you need to run chromium genome or exome, depending on your application goals. Great, thanks. The next question is, if GDNA is heat liable, should we keep the DNA in ice at all times? Yes, we definitely recommend keeping the DNA on ice while you're working with it. Um, there are some explicit instructions in the user guide around DNA quantification, um, but anytime you're not actively working within the, the, the guidelines of our protocol, keep the DNA on ice, store the DNA at four degrees Celsius, and when you're done with the sample, you can move it to deep storage at minus 20 Celsius. In our hands, we work mostly with DNA extracted with, by the Kyogen Megatract kit, we know that DNA is incredibly clean. So what we found, and we've tested this, we've left tubes of DNA in the fridge for months, and there is no change in DNA quality. So we get great DNA months and months down the road. Um, however, this may not be true for other sample preparation methods if there are any carryover contaminants, which is why we always recommend erring on the safe side, which is keep your DNA at 4C, store it at 4C for a couple of weeks while you're working with it, um, and then when you're done, just move it to minus 20 for long-term storage. A couple freeze thaws is not gonna have um, a strong negative impact on the DNA, so you can always go back, um, thaw it, and take another aliquot if you need one several months later. Okay, next question. After using blue pippin, how do you validate the GDNA side? Is bioanalyzer or tape station okay, or do, or do you need to run a PFGE? So the hard thing about validating what you get after running the blue pippin is that oftentimes you won't have enough concentration to run a gel or a tape station assay. So we get the question all the time, how much DNA do you get back after running blue pippin? And the answer is that it completely depends on what the DNA looked like before. So if you have DNA that's mostly around 20 KB and you want to remove all of the fragments that are less than 40 KB, you might not be left with very much at the end. So what we do internally is we just take that sample, we don't run QC, and we always just put it directly into chromium genome. We found that the cutoffs empirically are pretty accurate. When we did, you know, in, in contrast, when we did the initial method development, just to, just to ask the question, does this instrument really work as it should, we made sure to input DNA at a high enough concentration that we had enough to run back on a pulse field gel. And when we did that, we could see the cutoff lines were really clear at 20 and 40 KB, exactly where they were supposed to be. But with our experimental samples, we weren't able to do so. Um, there is one instrument out there that could probably do good DNA QC after running PIPIN, and that's the Femto Pulse from Advanced Analytical. It only requires, I think, a nanogram of DNA, and it can give you an accurate size measurement up to around 150 KB. So you have, if you have access to that instrument, it's great, um, but it's not very common right now. So uh, unfortunately, if you have a low concentration of DNA, there's no good way to look at the length before running chromium genome. But again, we found that the instrument just empirically works really well. So we don't need to run that QC afterwards. All right, the next question. Does it matter how a tissue sample is frozen? Flash frozen or slow frozen? And how long can it be frozen? So we found certainly up to a few months. So what we do is keep our tissue samples frozen um, in liquid nitrogen vapor, so we have a cryo tank for that purpose. What we found definitely doesn't work is repeated freezing and thawing of the tissue. So one piece of advice is when you get your tissue in, chop it up into small pieces before, and we always snap freeze on liquid nitrogen. We haven't done a comparison with slow freezing. Um, I think at some point we'll, we probably will and we'll let you know what we find, but certainly snap freezing is safe. 
the probably the most important thing is to just minimize once it is thawed. I always think about when nucleases can be active or versus when they can't be active. And as soon as you start to thaw and bring something to room temperature, that's when you have to be very, very careful. So that's, that's what I would recommend is working really quickly. I wouldn't be surprised if slow freezing and snap freezing are identical. It's just not something we've specifically tested. Okay. For blood samples, what is the best method to get as high molecular weight DNA as possible? If we use the SPRI method, would we get greater than 100 kb as with the tissue case? I think you probably could, but the nice, so the, the nice thing about the Kyogen kit for whole blood is that you literally take 200 microliters of whole bl blood, add it to lysis buffer, and you're done. There are no additional processing steps required. Um, with the SPRI method or the salting out method, I think what you're going to have to do is just lyse the red blood cells and wash the sample once before using the protocols. Um, and there are a lot of easy buffers for doing so. If you do that, um, I'm, I'm pretty confident that you'll get, you'll get really good results from those other two protocols. It's not something we've specifically tested yet, but it's really straightforward to do. Just lyse the cells, spin them, and wash them. Because what you want to get rid of um, and why you, want to, why you want to get rid of the, the red blood cells and work quickly is that when the red blood cells lyse, they release a lot of oxidative compounds. And we know for a fact that that can damage the DNA. So you just want as many of them gone when you're actually doing the cell lysis and the proteinase K digestion. So that's why we recommend, if you're, if you're going to do, test our other protocols, get rid of the red blood cells. Now, for the Kyogen kit, they must have figured out the right way to chelate all of those oxidative compounds um, because it's not a problem with the Kyogen kit. So if you want the simplest protocol for blood, use the Magatrack method and our demonstrated protocol. Um, but I do encourage you to test out our other two protocols and let us know if it works. I'm actually really curious. I, I think it will work. All right, the next question. What kind of tissue is breast tissue? Adipose, muscle, which tissue do you suggest for very high molecular weight DNA from mammalian tissues? Have you tested any other tissue types? We have not directly tested other tissue types. We had a collaborator test colon tissue and everything worked fine. Um, our breast tissue that we tested was not particularly adipose rich. Um, I know that there will be some special challenges in terms of grinding the sample and getting the nuclei out, um, but I, I think it would be fine. Really, the, the only thing we know that doesn't work well is liver. Um, also, anything really fibrous might be challenging because you do have to kind of uh, crush the tissue a little bit to release the nuclei. Um, but I think many, many tissue types would be compatible. All right. Um, what's the difference between a PFGE and the PIP and Pulse PFGE? Cost is the biggest difference, <laughs> but I'll tell you a little bit about each, how each of those instruments works. So the PFGE from BioRad, um, it's a large tank, and it has a cooling circulating water bath that maintains a precise temperature while you're running the gel. So that's one of the differences between the two systems. So the BioRad system for pulse field gel electrophoresis is expensive, um, whereas the PIP impulse from Sage Science is really, really affordable. But there are trade-offs there. So with the PFGE system, you get really precise temperature control. Um, with the PIP impulse, you don't. It's a power supply that you plug into your own gel box. So it kind of runs at room temperature, um, which definitely increases run-to-run -run variability. I have a lot of experience with pulse field gel electrophoresis, and temperature control is one of the biggest components for reproducibility. Um, the other difference is that the electrodes are laid out in a hexagonal pattern on the BioRad pulse field gel box, which allows you to program different paths, kind of stair-step paths that the DNA walks through as it, as it migrates through the gel, and that results in very slow and accurate separation. And the Sage Science box, you do a straight back and forth. So instead of a staircase action, it's more like shuttling back and forth. Um, and that reduces the resolution a little bit. But they essentially work under the same principles, which is that switching the electric field act actually enables long DNA molecules to be separated by size. 
I'm sure you guys are all familiar with running standard agarose gels where everything just runs as a single band. And that's because once a long DNA molecule is going through that gel, they all travel at the same rate. It's, you have to start and stop, start and stop, start and stop that current, and that's the only way that you can get the big molecules to separate. Okay, next question. Are there any good protocols to enrich a target region in the human chromosome? Would it be better to do target enrichment during high molecular weight DNA sample prep or during the last short read library step? So we recommend doing enrichment at the end. So adding your whole genomic DNA sample, making the linked read library, and then doing your target enrichment on the linked read library. And I'll explain why that's our default recommendation. So one of the factors you need to consider when running Chromium Genome is that you want to make sure that you don't end up with two copies of the same locus in a single gem. And we design the system around the whole human genome. So we design the system around the complexity of the human genome. So if you add an anagram of DNA, you're not going to see two copies of the same locus occupying the same gem. If you enrich your sample and you add a far less complex sample to the chromium genome assay, what you're doing is upping your chances of getting two copies of that locus in the same gem, in the same droplet, and that will not give you the results that you're looking for. We're looking to separate out all those different haplotypes or separate out the two haplotypes and make sure they're never in the same gem with each other. So if you do a pre-enrichment, two things are going to happen. One is that you aren't going to retain the full length of the molecule. If you do a hybrid capture, um, you're going to shear up the DNA. There are some new emerging technologies. I know Sage Science is working on a technique to do an enrichment and maintain the length. Um, but once you have that enriched sample, if you add the purely enriched sample to the chromium genome assay, you might be upping your rate of what we call barcode collision or having too many copies in the same gem. So that's why it's a little complicated. I think it can be done um, to definitely write to us if you want to continue the conversation. But in contrast, it's super simple to do the target enrichment afterwards. So you have a library of really short molecules, and every molecule is encoded with a 10x barcode. And we, we didn't really talk about how the workflow works on this webinar, but I'm sure most of you are familiar with the very high points. But essentially, we take a really long piece of DNA and we generate very short fragments inside of our gems. And each of those fragments is tagged with an identical barcode that links them all together afterwards. So in your final library, you have a bunch of these short fragments. And each of those fragments has a barcode on it. Fragments that share the same barcode come from the same starting molecule. So what you can do is just enrich for those regions you want you're enriching off the short molecules, so you're getting a very clean, efficient capture, and you're retaining all of the long-range links. And that's really how our exome workflow um, works, is that you, you do the enrichment at the end. So that's our default recommendation. But if you have some other um, specific questions or specific application and are interested in pre-enrichment, do please contact us. All right, next question. Do you recommend a method for determining amount of single-stranded DNA versus double-stranded? We don't. So we've never been able to successfully and quantitatively identify the percentage of single-stranded DNA in solution. I know that there are some gels that have a differential stain based on single or double, and you can also use an instrument like the Nanodrop, which will you know, the, the absorbance coefficient is different whether the DNA is single or double-stranded. Um, we haven't found that that helps out our workflow at all, um, unfortunately. So we haven't found a really great assay for that. We really just stick to quantitative measurement of double-stranded DNA um, with qubit dye. All right. Um, which extraction methods work best for very low input samples, for example, single Daphnia? Ah, so I would recommend, um, I'd recommend salting out for that. And the reason I'd recommend that is 
you can kind of adjust the volumes you're working with more easily. When you're working with the magnetic bead-based protocols, we specify volumes, amounts of beads to add, and you're doing a lot of uh, mixing and diluting, and you're, you're moving the solutions around a lot. And if you don't have a lot of DNA there, it could be subjected to greater physical shear. So at higher concentrations, DNA has a higher viscosity and it sort of is more self-protective. So if you're working with very low input amounts, I'd encourage seeking out protocols where you can really easily adjust the volumes to maintain higher concentration. So we're working on right now exploring uh, high molecular weight DNA isolation from single mosquito pupae, and we're finding that the salting out protocol works pretty well for that. Um, the mosquito pupae are, are soft and squishy. I know I'm learning far more about insects than I ever thought I would with the, at this job. Um, but the mosquito pupae are very easy to crush, um, and we found that we can get really nice looking DNA on a pulse field gel out of a single mosquito pupae using salting out. So um, to the person who asked this question, if you want our sort of where, where are we now with this protocol? And if you want some specific advice, just write to 10X support and we'll get you the answer and get you on the right path. But that sounds like a really interesting project. A lot of people are interested in single bugs. Okay, next question. Is there a repair enzyme that 10X recommends for single stranded DNA damage of the high molecular weight DNA? Yes, that's, that's a question we get a lot, and it's kind of, you know, it's a really obvious question if we talk about the dangers of single-stranded damage, then on the other side of the coin is how do we fix the damage? So again, that's something we're looking at internally right now. Um, we tried sort of the obvious first couple of steps. We used some commercially available repair kits, and depending on the degree of damage, um, the gains you can get vary from this kit. So samples that are more damaged, we are able, you know, we don't really see a positive impact right now. Samples that are very minorly damaged actually do respond well to DNA repair. So I think there's going to be optimization required. I, I don't think anything's impossible, um, but certainly out of the box, we don't have a solution yet for the heavily damaged DNA. Um, but as we start to work on this, and get some information out onto the community. We would love to know what you guys think and how these protocols work in your own hands. Specifically, I think that there will be a lot of optimization required. So there might be different strategies for different types of samples. I know a lot of people are interested in repairing archival samples, and that might take a bit more work. All right, uh, we have two questions. Actually, they're very similar, so I'm gonna read you both of them. Um, sure. The first one is, we've tried the spry protocol. Occasionally, the spry beads stick together and don't migrate to the magnet well. This happened on different types of tissues. Any idea what may cause this? And the second question is, along the same lines, during the spry protocol, have you ever experienced the beads not binding to the magnet? If so, what may cause this? Any ideas uh, why this may have happened? Interesting. So I am going to give an answer, and if I'm way off base, <laughs> feel free to chat back to Shauna, um, and I can offer maybe some clarifications. Um, one thing we noticed, so a good, a good sign, and we, we noticed this when we were developing or optimizing the Magatrack protocol, is when the magnetic beads start to clump together, it's generally a good sign that the DNA is very high molecular weight, and it's sort of the beads are locking themselves together. I always think of the DNA like a lasso that's binding them all. Um, if the beads aren't migrating to the magnet, the first question I'd ask is how viscous is the solution? If you take a wide bore P1000 and you try and pipette it, are you able to move that solution around or is it so thick and chunky that you can't? Um, if it is viscous, I'd recommend diluting the solution um, and you have to dilute it. I wouldn't dilute it necessarily with water or PBS. You'd have to dilute it with the spry binding buffer um, to make sure that you're still maintaining the attachment of the DNA onto the magnetic beads. But I would try to dilute the sample and see if that helps. Um, other mechanisms for why the DNA or why the beads wouldn't bind to the magnet, I'm not quite sure if there are other, if there are other chemicals in there. I think my advice would be the same, which would be to try and dilute it. Try and dilute and see if that helps. 
and if not, definitely write to support and take some, some photos and we can hopefully help you troubleshoot. Okay, thank you. We have a few more questions. Uh, no RNA-A treatment is done during the salting out method protocol. So how can we eliminate RNA contamination before the chromium prep? So we found that RNA actually doesn't have a negative impact on the performance of the assay. And what we hypothesize is that during the denaturation step, the first step of the chromium genome workflow is to mix the genomic DNA with um, sodium hydroxide. And, and we think it's at that step that a lot of the RNA is degraded. Either that or it doesn't amplify in the assay. It was one of those sort of, um, it's a nice robustness of the system that you can completely skip that step with no negative impact. RNAs A is present in the Kyogen commercial, the commercial kit, so the Megatrack protocols we recommend. Um, so we recommend just keep it in there, run it as is. Um, but yeah, for salting out, it's not specifically added to the protocol, but doesn't have any inhibitory effects. Um, if you do see an inhibitory effect, or if you do think you're seeing a problem from RNA, definitely let us know. I'd be, I'd be interested in learning more about um, your sample type and, and what you found. Okay, would you recommend ethanol stored specimen or fresh frozen samples for high molecular weight gene DNA isolation? I would recommend fresh frozen samples. Um, I know that there are a lot of reagents and a lot of techniques out there for preserving tissue and preserving blood, and I don't have any evidence to say that they don't work, except that we just haven't tried that personally. Um, we have tried fresh frozen tissue, and we know that is compatible, which is why that would be my default recommendation. Um, but we've written to, I know Kyogen cells, um, you know, it's not an, an ethanol-based method. For, they, ha they have a reagent for storing tissue. Um, I've spoken to them, asked if that would have any covalent modifications or any mechanisms that would render the DNA unsuitable for amplification, and they said no. Um, so I think it's a great thing to try, and we, we just don't have any experience with it. So um, if you try it and, and it works, let us know. And if you try it and, you know, it, and it doesn't work, also let us know. We'd be really interested. Okay, thank you, Jill. That looks like the last question that we have in our chat. I'd like to thank Jill for her great answers and all the attendees for their fantastic questions. We'll be posting a recording of this session on the 10X community shortly, and we'll look into possibly making a PDF of the slides available as well. If we didn't uh, get to your question or you have a follow-up question, we urge you to post it on the 10X community in our DNA sample prep forum at community.10xgenomics.com or to contact our support team at support at 10xgenomics.com. And finally, we'd love your feedback on this 10 expert workshop and invite you to fill out a brief survey at the end of this session. Um, and you can also see our upcoming workshops uh, coming up for structural variant analysis, single cell RNA seq data analysis, as well as a new repertoire profiling. Thank you very much and have a great rest of your day.